All right, Mr. Covey, I'm going to start off with your dad first, if that's okay. Man. That's wonderful. What did you learn from him that when you look back, you go, wow, I picked up a couple of things from this guy? <laughs> yeah. Well, a, a lot of things. And obviously, the, the principles that he taught, you know, each of, each of the seven habits he taught individually as a separate principle before he had put them all together. And so I remember growing up, you know, learning about being proactive. And I remember growing up and, you know, learning about how to do empathic listening, which mm. became habit five, seek first to understand. And I, remember, and I remember growing up, you know, thinking about putting first things first. So he had, he had taught the, the habits to us children. There's nine kids in our family. <laughs> and you know he he taught it in he taught the habits individually before he had put them together into a connected whole that was made it even more powerful yeah. there was synergy to the whole and and so i learned the that i learned great principles of leadership but let me tell you the, the biggest thing i learned in addition to these great principles of leadership i saw in my in my father a great model of what he taught. And I'll just put it this way, Mina, that as, as good as, I said this at my father's funeral, that as good as my father was in public, as, a, as an author and as a teacher, as yeah. a speaker, as good as he was in, in public, and he was very good, he was even better in private. Wow. As a husband to my mother, as a father to us kids. He was who you thought he was. Wow. He had real integrity. So, you know, I, I've seen this happen before where someone can get on the stage and just dazzle an audience yeah. with a great presentation and eloquence and like, and then they walk off stage and they're like a different person with, and they don't treat everyone with respect. Well, my father, he was good on stage, even great on stage, and he was better off stage. And it's truly the most kind and accurate tribute I could pay him is that as good as he was in public, he was even better in private. I got to ask this question. Where is the biography? <laughs> I mean, man, just, <laughs> because he was amazing, man. He's amazing. We're, we're actually working on one. Are you? Oh, yeah. I cannot wait to read that one. I can't, man, just because I just, his principles were just so concrete, but so simple, if that yes. makes sense. And, yes. And then the, the whole store process was awesome to me. I mean, because if you're ADHD, you need to touch and feel if that makes sense. And so I had the planner <laughs> and all that stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. It was tactile. It was real. It made it. It was, <laughs> it was really actionable for people. That, yeah. that was my, my father's gift. He had many gifts, but one was making complex things simple. Yeah. And you know he wasn't simplistic. Right. Like it was a it was a simplicity, not a sim, not being simplistic. It's a big difference, right? Yeah. And and um, he could make the complex simple. He also could make it memorable. You know, mm. be proactive. Think win win. Begin with the end in mind. Synergize so that you remember it. But he also could make it actionable accessible for people so they could actually apply it. And, and um, I like what Jim Collins wrote in the foreword for seven habits that was done after my dad passed away that um, he said, my father created, well, he talked about how um, the internet had actually existed in 1969, but it was all technical. There was not a, an easy user interface. And it wasn't until the browser came out that it suddenly gained its, you know, its ubiquity in the 90s when, when, when a browser came, a user interface that made it workable. He said, my, he said, my father in Seven Habits created a human user interface for connecting people that suddenly took principles that were out there, but brought them together in a way that you could make sense of. He did. He really did. So I just, I'm a, once again, I'm a big fan. Um, I got to ask this question. Please. How did you write this book 
And oh, by the way, we're in the middle of a, a pandemic of the century. Man. I know it. <laughs> I mean, like, how did you like, what prayer were you praying? <laughs> what were you doing during that time? Right. Just the timing of it, right? <laughs> how, how did that work? <laughs> I mean, well, I, I will, you know, the funny thing is, I started working on the book six years ago. Before the pandemic in 2016. Are you serious? Yeah. And oh. and it, it just takes me a while to really organize. And so um, I've been working on the book for some time. But then when the pandemic hit, it just accelerated everything. It did. It, did. it was 10 years in one yeah. of, of, you know, moving the workforce forward with the workplace, you know, work from home, work from anywhere hybrid, remote, flexible work, all these things. And it really also accelerated the importance of, of a leadership style that is relevant for this new world of work. And yeah. command and control is not going to cut it in this new world. Uh, no. And I, I think we knew that going into before COVID even hit. I do too. I mean, you look at Generation Z, you just go, uh, this is not them. <laughs> I mean, not them. Not even close. <laughs> and then here we get into the pandemic and you just go, oh no, like we are really behind, if that makes sense. At, absolutely. Yeah, we knew it beforehand. That's why I was working on this in 2016, before the pandemic. Yeah. It was basically saying, look, the old way that we've led and even maybe gotten incrementally better in is not relevant for people today. And, and for a time of change and disruption, this is before the pandemic. Yeah. You know, all these changes that people don't want to be managed. People want to be led. They really do. And they want to be trusted. I actually heard David Gergen. I have his book, right? Yes. Here. I love David Gergen. Incredible book. And I have to agree with David. Like, this is not sustainable um, at all. <laughs> like, I don't know what's going on, but it is not sustainable. And so when I'm reading your book, I'm going, yeah, this is where we've got to get to. And so I got asked this question because we we are in a tailspin. I mean, this is not, this is not a great, I love this country, but this is not a great season. Um, what can we do to get out of this? Like, how do we really trust and inspire? Yeah. Yeah, we we need we need leaders that become models. Yeah. And models that can become mentors. We need people to, we need leaders that go first, that don't wait on everybody else, that lead out in saying, look, there's a better way to lead people. And we need to trust people. And we need to trust, we need to have goodwill yeah, towards, yeah. towards each other. We're not, we don't, people don't listen today and we don't extend goodwill. We don't extend trust. And so we're, we're, we're trapped in this, quagmire in in this you know gridlock and with people not with people not feeling heard or understood and with very little goodwill and very good very little extension of trust to another person and assuming a positive intent and rather than kind of saying well we're trapped in that what can you do you know, nothing you can do no we've got to we've got to change it from the inside out it's got it's, we need leaders who become models of going first, of taking that risk. People like Satya Nadella, what he's doing at Microsoft, where he goes first. By the way, that's amazing what he's doing there, by the it, way. It is amazing. It's amazing. I, I couldn't agree, agree more. It's amazing. He models, he trusts, he inspires. Um, you know, Cheryl Batchelder, our mutual friend, yeah. he's a great leader who models the behavior, trusts and inspires. I think of, uh, you know, a great example of modeling is this is Ken Chenault just retired. He modeled, he, you know, he had such integrity that it gave him a credibility. I, I got to stop you right here. It's where it gets funny. I'm actually going out for an interview with, with Ken Chenault. As you say that, James Brown from CBS Sports, right, sent me a text message. When that, when that, you heard that bing, that was James Brown's text message. Yeah. So, wow. so part of me is like, okay, God, like, what's going on here? <laughs> I don't know what to think. So, Ken 
no, you're right about him. I mean, yeah, he had he had such moral authority yes. because of who he was. Yeah, and and um, so that's so you know he's a model that went first. Um, I, I I'm friends with Indra Nui, who just retired as CEO of PepsiCo, and she demonstrated, you know, she she moved people in, from into this inspire side. Mm. You know, I, I call I call the style of leadership that's needed trust and inspire we're going towards inspiration that's where leadership is going today mina towards inspiration yeah. and 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 that will that we can tap into inspiration you know in 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 two key ways one is connecting to purpose and that's what indra did so well the idea of you know she she called it performance with purpose yeah. and and you know always trying to purpose but also you you inspire people when you connect with people right through, through a sense of caring and belonging that alone if that's all you do as a leader is you connect with people through caring genuine caring through even love through belonging that can inspire like nothing else really yes absolutely um you think about it think of think of people you know we, we've often here's the thing we've often kind of equated inspiration with charisma you know as if as if you know to inspire you got to be charismatic yeah but i don't know about you mina but i know some people who others might describe as charismatic yeah but who are not really inspiring no but but but, but, and, but charismatic like cotton candy is yeah it's like is, cotton candy yeah. and, and i mean <laughs> Yeah. And the flip side is I know other people who no one would describe as charismatic, but who are extraordinarily inspiring. Yeah. I'm just thinking of a teacher right now of at in my at school with my daughter and and um just the caring. And and how do you inspire? Well, you inspire when you model, when you model a behavior, when people see a model, someone that models humility, that inspires. There's overwhelming data that, you know, modeling, going first ins will inspire others. Like Ken Chenault, he's inspiring. He's often, people around him often refer to him as inspiring. You model, you're, excuse me, you inspire people when you trust them. Yeah. So that's the second, there's three stewardships, modeling, trusting, inspiring. So you model when you extend trust to people. I like to put it this way, Mina, to be trusted is the most inspiring form of human motivation. It brings out the very best in almost all of us, if not all. You know, when we're trusted, when someone believes in us, has confidence and extends trust in us and tells us that they trust us, we, we wanna prove that justified. We wanna do our very best and rise to the occasion, perform even better for such a person that has such belief and confidence in us. And, and that inspires us and then, so already, when you do the first two stewardships, when you model, you're inspiring. When you trust people, you inspire them. And then what really brings us home is when you is, is connection, connecting with people through caring and belonging and connecting people to purpose, to meaning and to contribution. That will inspire. And inspire comes from the Latin term inspirare, which means to breathe life into. Mm. And think about it. So trust and inspire. I'm breathing life into relationships, into teams, into cultures. Command and control tends to suck the life out of instead of breathing life into. And so, you know, but I ignite the fire within and, and inspiration is better than motivation. Motivation tends to be external. You know, it's carrot and stick rewards. Yeah. Can it work? Sure. And it motivates people to want to get more rewards, but inspiration is internal. It's intrinsic. Yeah. You ignite the fire within somebody and that can burn for months, if not years, without having to provide more external stimulus, you know, stimulus, rewards. And you ignite that fire within, you light, you know, you, it's like a candle being lit and goes and lights other candles. Wow. That's what inspiration does. So, so, you know, you inspire others when you first are inspired, but then when you model, you trust, and then when you connect with people through caring, show that you care. And then when you, and you connect people to purpose, to meaning, to contribution, 
that inspires. Yeah. Man, I got to ask this question. I got a couple more to get in. Yeah. In the research process of this, was there a moment <laughs> or moments when you said, oh, wow, I think we may have something here where you felt to yourself, I get it. This is why I'm writing this book. Um, what, what one or two moments were there? Yeah, I'll give you two of them. One was to see that um, the data that we found that um, people overestimated how much they trusted other people. That leaders thought that they trusted a lot, but then when the when the their direct reports and 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 those that they were leading when they were asked, does the leader extend trust? They they um, they said not very much at all. It was the leaders overestimated how much they trusted by three times. Wow! And so they thought they were being trusting when they're really not people didn't experience as being trusting mm. and 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 um I, so i like to put it this way the biggest barrier to becoming a trust and inspire leader is that we think we already are one <laughs> <laughs> you know it's kind of like yeah i do that i trust people and, you know, i trust people but then when you ask the people they don't feel fully trusted yeah and and so that that, that was one and the research showed it was about three times um overestimation of how much people think they trust compared to how others interpret how much they trust. What did you, okay, I'm writing a book on mentorship. In fact, I'm heading down to Pensacola in two weeks. It's been some Beautiful. Time with the former CEO of Waffle House. If you've not met Bert, you guys have got to meet. Um, I don't mind connecting you to him if you'd like me to, but Bert has written a book on mentorship and it's a really in incredible book, in fact. Um, what have, what have you learned about mentorship when you look back just in your time in business and leadership wise, why is it so important and how do mentors inspire well? Yes, I think mentorship is, is vital because they, it's the best way to really help impact another person. Mm to where they, I mean, they're, they're open. See, a ment here's what a mentor is to me. A mentor is a model with a relationship. So, you know, if, I, if, if I'm serving as a mentor, that means that I, I, I'm a model. It doesn't mean, by, by a model, I don't mean I'm perfect, but I'm, I'm showing them a, the way. I'm showing them a path. I'm showing them the kind of leadership that, that is working by me being that kind of leader. And, but now it's not just me doing this in isolation. I'm doing it with a relationship of trust yeah. with another person where I care about that person mm. and they see a model that cares about them. That is a, that has a great power to really impact another. I'll learn I'll, if I'm a mentee and I'm, and I have a mentor who cares about me, who also is a good model of, the kind of leader I want to be, that will impact me more than any workshop I go to, than mm -hmm. any other th book I might read, is a mentor who is a model that cares about me and is trying to help me. That impacts me. And so we, we need that kind of movement. We, I like to say, you know, in a world filled with command and control leaders, we need models who become mentors. Wow. Of, of, of trust and inspire leadership so that we can say, no, there's another way to do this. You don't have to default to yesterday's model of leadership, of command and control, or even this more sophisticated, advanced, you know, enlightened command and control, that version of it. No, we need models of trust and inspire who can become mentors. And we, we say, look, look at this way of leading. What if we can all lead like Sacha and Adela and Cheryl Batchelder, what if we had more models like that? And when that when the model becomes a mentor, you really impact people. When the model becomes a mentor, 
wow. Yeah. That, <laughs> man, okay. I, 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 I hate that my time is almost up. Um, when you hit send on this, when you were, when it was ready to go, did you feel like you had finished it or did you feel like, I think I got something else to honestly say here? Well, I, I felt like I, I had finished it because I think I got the big ideas in. The, the context will always be changing yeah. around, but I kind of got the main points that the world is changing, but our style of leadership hasn't kept pace with it and it needs to. And, yeah. and so whether, you know, the pandemic and everything, um, and, you know, like, for example, we don't know exactly what the future of work is going to be. Right. Other than it's likely going to be flexible with, you know, flexible teams with either some hybrid or some remote hybrid combination, but that's, it's going to look different for different organizations. But here's what we do know that to lead in this new world of work where it's going to be some, un, you know, it, we haven't defined exactly what it's going to look like. It's going to rely upon being trust and inspire, not command and control. Yeah. And so, you know, there's some things that is kind of like, I don't know exactly how that's going to play out on what work will look exact like. It'll be different for different organizations. But I can say this, those that lead with command and control in this new world of work are going to become less and less relevant by the day. Those that lead with trust and inspire are going to be really relevant. You know, and I'll give you an illustration of that. Think of, you know, uh, what was it, six months ago or a few months ago when some CEOs said, okay, everyone, come back to the office. <laughs> you know, in New York City, come back to the office, everyone back. And pe people didn't come back. They didn't come back. <laughs> they didn't come back. <laughs> yeah. They didn't come back at all. It's no, like, yeah. no. And, and, yeah. and suddenly yeah. that, that leader had to, they had to renegotiate. They had to talk about it more because the world's changed and you can't just command and control your way. That's, you know, come back, everyone. That's command and control. No, trust and inspire is, hey, let's figure out what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. And what you're looking for as a, as a vital team member. And let's try to come up with solutions to help us do both. I to, you, know, you know, what's weird what my wife said, because she's in the middle part of reading it right now. Uh -huh. She said, you know, what I think Maya." and I said, yeah, go ahead. She goes, I think companies that trust and inspire have better customer service performance. She goes, but if someone is commanding and controlling, she goes, I guarantee you, you can correlate poor customer service to command and control leadership style. I said, are you kidding me? She goes, I really do think so. And she wanted me to ask you about that. And I said, I think you could be on something. She's right. Absolutely. Let me tell you why. Because she, she's absolutely right. It's because, because it's inside out. Yeah. And the, your people are inside, your customers are outside. If you, if you are command and control with your people, guess what? That ripples out to your customers. Oh, wow. And it's and and so you don't if you, if you kind of command and control your people, ultimately, your people tend to treat others like they're treated, and they'll be they'll just be efficient, and you know they, they'll do the minimum that they need to do, but that's it. But if you're trust and inspire with your people, connect with them, trust them, inspire them, show caring, then it's natural for people who you trust to go out and build trust with customers yeah. but it's not natural at all for people who you don't trust <laughs> to say go out and build trust with customers so your wife's exactly right if if i feel trusted as a customer service rep then it's natural for me to want to build trust with customers if yeah. i feel distrusted and that i'm basically no they don't trust me and they're, and they're micromanaging me and hovering over me then i don't build those same relationships of trust with customers inside out wow Inside I, out. I think it's uh, beautiful. Can I ask you just one question, personal question? I Please. love to connect. Like, I love connecting. I feel, like I, I feel like I was born to do just that. I mean, it's one of those things where I just get up, and if I could do that all day, I really would. The only problem with it with this, Mr. Covey, is it doesn't pay the bills. Um, so, <laughs> oh, <it's, laughs> 
connect where it does pay the bills. Like, like I just want, because I love writing, I love interviewing that part. If I can do interviewing and connecting at the same time, that'd be like, like a dream come true, man. How do you get paid to do that? <laughs> because it's like, I feel like it's a God-given gift that he's given to me. Um, but man, it, it, it doesn't pay the bills. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of, <laughs> hope that makes sense there. Yeah, yeah. I think this, I think that, that increasingly the ability to connect and connect people and connect to people and with people, I think increasingly that will be something that it, that will be seen as more and more valuable and important. Mm. And we'll start to, you know, I think you'll start to find people that are really great connectors and that can connect mm. that that will begin to create its own, have its own economic value wow. as, a, as an important thing. I really think it's possible. And, um, you know, it's always the, the, it's always a balancing act of, of um, we're trying to, to do what we love mm. with what we're good at with what we feel called to do with the economic need. Yeah. Wow. And it's overlapping those four pieces kind of there, you know, cause um, yeah. you know, I love to watch football games, but no one's gonna pay me to watch football games, you know, but, but that, that, that didn't mean at a different time. It's not, not, you know, that there could not be a way that someone could overlap that with opportunity, you know, maybe they yeah. become a, an analyst or something, but, but, um, um, but I, I think there's, you know, it's, I, I, what was it? It was Jim Collins that talked about the hedgehog, right? Yeah. That you find the economic engine that, you know, what drives us. And so that's where there's an economic need. Is there a way you can meet needs? And I think companies increasingly are going to say, we, we've got to have connection. Mm. And that's going to be an economic need. It's going to have a greater and greater value. So your ability to be a connector, I think is going to grow in value. Wow. And, and, um, and then we match that with what you, what you love to do, your passion, and with what you're good at. And it sounds like you're good at this too, with the economic need. I think there's a, another overlap and that is what you feel called to do. And this is, you know, this is for a spiritual person like yourself faith-based person it's what you feel god wants of you you know your what your conscience tells you and and um you overlap all of that and and you and you try to find a place where what you feel called to do with what you're good at with um what you're passionate about overlaps with sol solving an economic need mm -hmm. And I just think the, where the workforce is going, it's increasingly collaborative. Yeah. It's increasingly interdependent. And that's where people that are good at connecting and connectors are gonna have an advantage in this, in the wow. emerging world of work. I've gone over five minutes. I hate doing that. Thank you so much. Um, I, I know this is such, it's it's rich <laughs> it's one of those things where you would told me five months ago that i'd be doing this i would say there's no way but i mean thank you my wife thinks you guys need to refund me on all the stuff i bought from the Stephen covey store <laughs> that's a whole nother topic altogether <laughs> i love it mina <laughs> thank you i just wish you guys best i do oh. this has been so rich Th thank you so much let me Here's the one last thought I wanted to, to say, because you asked me about what research points. I, I talked about how when people thought they, they overestimated, overestimated how much they trusted. The other piece of research is that a study from Zanger Folkman looked at 16 competencies that, that managers might have and what the employees wanted from their manager. The number one competency they wanted from their manager was their manager to inspire them. 
Yeah. And yet that was the number one thing they wanted. It also was one of the very lowest things of what they were getting. Yeah. So, so they want inspiration, but they're not getting the inspiration. Command and control will never inspire. Never. So this is, this is why it's saying we need to move away from command and control. And we're clear what we need to move away from. We're less clear what we need to move toward. I'm trying to name it, trust and inspire. I'm trying to call it, trying to describe it, saying it's, you, you have these fundamental beliefs of seeing the greatness inside of people. And you see people as whole people. So you want to inspire them, not just motivate because they're a whole person. And you, then you focus on those three stewardships. You model, you trust, and you inspire through connecting. And so everyone can inspire. It's a learnable skill, not just for the charismatic. Inspiring others is a learnable skill. And it's a stewardship we have as a leader. And that's inspiring for me with where this world is going. It's moving towards trust and inspiration. This is a better way to lead in a new world. And we need models who become mentors of that you can do this. You don't have to have the models be the old, just traditional command and control leaders. You know, what if we could have new models emerging like the Satya and Cheryl's that are trust and inspire leaders and those models become mentors to others and we soon create a virtuous upward spiral of a trust and inspire world. I, we're a long ways away from that, but the only way to get, to, to get there is to look in the mirror and start and, and become that model ourselves for others for whom we could also become a mentor. So that's my invitation for people everywhere is let us become the trust and inspire leaders that we all seek in our world today. I couldn't agree more. If I was in a black church, I would get up and say amen and run around the room. That I love a, it. That's a good closer. Thank you, sir. You're it's welcome. Good. I wish you the best. Oh my gosh, please. Anytime. I, 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 thank you. <laughs> this has been good. You're welcome. And I wish you every success, every good wish. And please give my best to your wife as well. Tell her she's right on because she, she's describing inside out. And, you know, you, the way you'll win in the marketplace is by first winning in the workplace. Hey, man, on that one. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And trust and inspire inside will help you build it outside. So inside out. Thank you, Mr. Covey. I appreciate this. It's been rich. Thanks. Sorry for going over. Thank you. No, I, I appreciate talking with you. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, Mina. Bye-bye.